we're going to turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 15 as we begin our study this morning in the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 15, we're going to begin in verse 1. Here's what it says in Luke 15, verse 1. Then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance." Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner repents. Lord, as we open your word this morning, God, we pray that you would speak to your people. Lord, we do not gather here today for the wisdom and words of men. We're seeking the wisdom and the words of God. Would your spirit speak through your living and active word this morning Would it help inform the way that we understand and view you and ourselves and the world around us? God, we pray for humility this morning. That we would place our own agenda, our own opinions under submission to your word. God, we pray that your spirit would um, call us to apply the things we learn today with a greater understanding of you, with a greater understanding of how you call us to live. And Lord, we thank you that you are a good shepherd. We thank you, Lord, that you seek out lost sheep. And we thank you, Lord, for the salvation that is found in you alone. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. If you're taking notes this morning and you want to write down a title, you could write this down. Lost and found, that's what we're going to look at this morning, lost and found through these two parables. But before we begin, I wonder by a show of hands, how many of you can't stand it when you lose something? Just, it just drives you absolutely nuts, okay? So we've got about 10% of an honest room and the other 90% who are just going to pretend like you love it when you lose something. I'm going to remind you of that when you lose your cell phone next time. And yet, how frequently do we lose things? True story, I wasn't even looking for a sermon illustration, and it just came to me. Last week with our our North and South team, we did a, a staff gathering, our final one before the launch, and we were given these cool sweatshirts that say, in the foothills as in heaven, and I was all excited to get mine, and then... No sooner than two hours later, I'm driving home and looking around the car and I'm going, I lost my sweatshirt. I have not even had the thing two hours and I don't know where it is. And I'm sending out a message to everybody, has anybody seen my sweatshirt? I don't know what I did with it. And, and right before bed that night, when I'm just kind of accepting the fact that I guess I've lost my brand new sweatshirt that I didn't even get to wear, I was like, oh my gosh, wait a second. And I run over my backpack And I open my backpack, and there it is in my backpack. It had been with me the whole day. But what I thought was the smart move was, I don't want to leave this somewhere, so I'm going to put it in the backpack. I will always have with me so I don't forget it. And instead, I forgot that I put it in the thing 
I didn't want to forget it in. I'm glad you enjoy it. I'm sure you can relate though. You've lost keys or a wallet or a phone. I'm starting to see the wisdom in these really ugly bowls people have in their house where they just always drop the keys or the phone or the tray or the place to hang them because they just need a place to live. Because if they don't have a place to live, it's all gone. And then you add in an element like we have in our home right now where you have multiple kids that love to pick up these kind of things and use them as a toy and a prop with what they're doing. And, you know, the number of times we have searched and searched to finally go to the kids, have you seen this? And they run to the, the dollhouse or under a cushion and, oh, I was playing with that and, and hit it somewhere. And you know all hope is lost, though, when you can't find it. And then you go to the kids and they haven't seen it and you've run out of excuses. It's truly just lost and you're stuck trying to find it. But it's one thing to lose a possession, especially one that you know, even if it's gonna be inconvenient, you could go through the process and replace. It's another thing to be lost as a person. I remember when I was at Bible college, going with a friend to the beach in Southern California. Now, uh, it's a new world we live in, I'm sure. Um, before cell phones and GPS, people were a lot more familiar with freeways and highways and which streets got them where, but uh, I'm a part of a generation that never uses a map unless it's on my iPhone and uses directions to get anywhere even within town. And so my friend and I had decided to go to the beach and we had pulled up the map on our phone and we got to this location we'd never been to and it was a great day until it was late that night and we'd been taking pictures with our phones and both of our phones died. And we thought, we'll be fine. We're two guys, grown men. We have a great sense of direction. We can figure out our way back to school. And hours upon hours of thinking we had made a right turn and we were finally headed in the correct direction to then get back on the same freeway and we're like, how are we back here? And if you've been to Southern California, the number of on-ramps and off-ramps and highways and freeways, and I'm like, we are the children of Israel in the wilderness right now. And I'm pretty sure we'll be here for the next 40 years. We had gone to countless gas stations and asked for directions, and it didn't seem like anybody really had a clue of where we were trying to get to. They're like, you just go right down there and you take that freeway and then you're going to get off on this exit. And we're like, okay. And we'd write it all down. We'd do exactly what they said. And I remember this. We were like, we're finally making it. We think we finally made progress. And we turn this corner and we're driving down this road and it's got to be close to midnight. And there's the gas station. We left like an hour ago. And I'm like, how? We've gone on freeways. We've gone on ramps, off ramps, and we got back to the very same spot. And I'm like, well, we can't go ask him for directions again, because clearly that's not going to help us. There was a very, very sweet celebration when we got back to the school that night, to say the least. But how many of us that perfectly describes the process of coming to the Lord. It wasn't that we didn't know where we needed to be. It's that we didn't know how to get there. For a lot of us, it's not that we didn't realize we needed a change in our lives, that there was something missing or that there was a, a lack of purpose and identity and, and calling in our life. We, we knew there was something missing, but we didn't necessarily know where it was or how to get there. Why do I bring this up this morning? Because what we see in our text is the heart of God for the lost. We often describe people as Christian or non-Christian, saved or non-saved, but in Luke, time and time again, we see the way he describes people as lost people and found people. And in our text, even this morning, Jesus through a prompt of the Pharisees and the scribes, is going to describe how 
We once were lost, but now have been found. Now, those two parables we're looking at this morning, well-known parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin. Next week, we're going to look at the, the prodigal son, the lost son. And of course, the Lord in his sovereignty and humor has, has allowed that to land on Father's Day. Not our plan, but it works quite nicely. But I love that this falls right on the heels of what we looked at last week, where he's calling people to count the cost and forsake everything to follow him, which may seem a bit extreme and it may cause you to feel overwhelmed at the idea of giving up everything to follow him. And yet right here, he brings to light the reality that we were once lost sheep, and yet we've been found by a good shepherd who sought us out and brought us home. But before we dive into these two parables, let's look at kind of the, the setting we're given, the context to which this chapter opens up. We're told that all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And that this is what the Pharisees and scribes were complaining about. That this man receives these sinners and he eats with them. And it's this that prompts his parables. Now, tax collectors and sinners um, were about as low as you could go on the social totem pole in that day. The tax collectors were Jews who were working for the Romans, so they were already seen as traitors to their own people, but also the way they made their wages was a very shady and dishonest way. You see, they were given by the Romans a standard they had to meet. They had to pull in a certain amount of money from the people in that region. But anything they made on top of that, that was their wage. So they would find any and every way they could to squeeze as much money as they could out of people to give themselves a nice fat lump sum of money and give the Romans the amount they needed. So not only are the other Jews so furious that you've betrayed us to work for the Romans, but you're also going to work us to the bone to try and get every little penny you can. You're taking advantage of your own people for your own greedy gain. Tax collectors, they were universally hated. Synagogues would not accept their alms. Their testimony wasn't received in Jewish courts. They were held to be worse than the heathen or the betrayer of their own people because of the shady kind of characters that would take such a job. And it tells you the kind of people they were if they were looking for this kind of job. No loyalty to their people, no care for their neighbor, looking out only for themselves and trying to get ahead. But we're given a, a second group of people here as well. That There are tax collectors, but there's also sinners. That's not to say tax collectors were not sinners, but this was a separate category of sinners. Now, in the, ver in the view of the Pharisees over here and these scribes, the sinner was a Jew who was not careful in their observance of the ceremonial duties. If you weren't a, a good Jew who was going to temple for your prayers, who was keeping the Sabbath and following the law, you were just considered a no good sinner. But this could also be a, a category that would summarize those who were living in open and unrepentant sin. And given this background, you can begin to see why these Pharisees and these scribes are up in arms because Jesus not only is accepting these people to be found with him, he's eating a meal with them. Now, before we talk about this idea of having a meal together, let's talk about these Pharisees and scribes. They were seen as the elite religious sect of the day. But we've seen Jesus' interactions with these men time and time again. These are people with full heads of knowledge of godly men who were shepherds in the Old Testament. Men like David, a man after God's own harp, a shepherd, a warrior, a king. 
Men like Abraham, Moses, who led the people out of Egypt into the promised land. Yet in the New Testament, this opinion has drastically shifted. Because you see, shepherds in that day... They worked seven days a week. You're watching the sheep constantly, which meant that you did not have time to practice the Sabbath. You didn't have time to go to the synagogue. You were seen as ceremonially unclean. And also, many shepherds in that day were known as thieves, were known as not being as intelligent because they weren't going to the school with all these young boys who were going to become Pharisees. So you've got a group of shepherds that are known as being unintelligent, untrustworthy, and unclean. So for Jesus to start the parable saying to these Pharisees and scribes, just picture yourself as the shepherd that's lost a sheep, would have immediately brought gasps to their mouth. But Jesus knew that because of the value of a sheep that had been lost, it was obvious what everybody would do in that situation, that they would, they would go seek the sheep that was lost. They would seek to find it, and that search would be anything but casual. It would be an urgent and diligent search for a valuable possession if a sheep was lost. Philip Keller, in his book, A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23, which, if you haven't read, Just make that your homework. It's a phenomenal book from a shepherd through the perspective of a shepherd looking at Psalm 23. But here's how he describes the process when a shepherd would lose their sheep. He says, the way it happens is this. A heavy, fat, or long-fleeced sheep will lie down comfortably in some little hollow or depression of ground. It may roll on its side slightly to stretch out or relax, and suddenly... The center of gravity in its body shifts so that it turns on its back far enough that the feet no longer touch the ground. It may feel a sense of panic and start to paw frantically. Frequently, this only makes things worse. It rolls over even further, and now it is quite impossible for it to regain its feet. As it lies there struggling, gases begin to build up in the rumen. As these expand, they tend to retard and cut off blood circulation to the extremities of the body, especially the legs. If the weather is very hot and sunny and a cast sheep is laid down on its back, it can die within just a few hours. If it is cool and cloudy and rainy, it may survive in the position for several days. It is not easy to convey on paper the sense of this ever-present danger within the sheep. If I saw black-winged buzzards circling overhead, anxiety would grip me. This is part of the drama depicted for us in the story of the 99 sheep and the one astray. This is the shepherd's deep concern, his agonizing search, his longing to find the missing one, His delight in restoring it not only to its feet, but also to the flock, as well as to himself. Again and again, I would spend hours searching for a single sheep that was missing. As soon as I reached the cast ewe, my very first impulse was to pick it up. I would hold it erect, rubbing the limbs of the ewe to restore the circulation to her legs. And when the sheep started to walk again, she often stumbled, staggering and collapsing, but little by little, the sheep would regain its equilibrium. It would start to walk steadily and surely again. By and by, it would dash away to rejoin the others, set free from its fears and frustrations, given another chance to live a little longer." And so you begin to gain a better understanding and perspective for what that pursuit would have looked like when the shepherd is counting the sheep and beginning to realize that one has gone astray. 
There was no casual attitude about it. Ah, well, that one always goes missing. It'll find its way home. That's just one. I mean, I've got 99. That's a passing grade, right? Like, we'll leave the one. We'll figure it out later. No, there was a time clock now because if that sheep was cast onto its back, there was a time limit that you had to get to that thing before it died. And if it's not cast on its back, you have the danger of predators. Sheep are not able to defend themselves. I don't know if you've been around there very much. You know, we have signs on our fences that tell us beware of dog. You don't see one for beware of sheep, do you? Maybe if you're driving a car, like, watch out so you don't run into a sheep because they're not quick to get out of the way. But for one sheep to leave and be on its own would be ripe for the picking of prey. In fact, even in David's testimony as he goes to fight Goliath, he recounts times when there was a lion, when there was a bear that were attacking the sheep and he had to defend the sheep. The sheep aren't taken on a bear or a lion. They're not taken on a wolf. Okay, so maybe they're not cast on their side. Maybe it's not the predator you're worried about, but sheep are also really stupid. So you just hope and pray it doesn't find a cliff with some nice food on the bottom of it because it will go right off after it. You hope it doesn't find a stream where it wants to cool off or get a drink of water where the the current's too strong because it'll get swept away in it. I mean, every single corner where you turn, there's a new danger when it comes to a sheep. It's kind of like having a toddler. When they're, when they're just big enough to start walking and running around, but they're not quite capable enough to make it up and down stairs or to have an understanding of things that are dangerous for them. And before where you're like, oh, my house is fine. It's childproof. If you don't have a child at home, when somebody brings a toddler over, you realize just how many dangers there are. The things they can reach and break and get stuck behind and climb on and You're like, I can't take my eye off of you. That's how it was for a shepherd. And that's the urgency they felt when a sheep went missing. They were personally responsible for these sheep. Now, for many of the shepherds in their day, it wasn't their own sheep they were watching. There were communal flocks An entire village or region of people's sheep were all gathered together and a shepherd would be watching sheep that belonged to other people. So not only do you feel the urgency because a sheep went missing, so there's a time clock. And if I don't find that thing soon, it's definitely going to be dead. But also, that might not even be my sheep. That's my neighbor's sheep. And you were held responsible for it to the point that even if you found it dead, you were responsible to bring back that fleece and give an account for it to that person of how it died and what took place. But these shepherds, they were experts at tracking. They could follow a stray sheep's footprints for miles across hills and valleys. It was a part of a shepherd's regular nine-to-five job to risk their life for the sheep. And if there's one thing the sheep were known for, it was they were good at getting lost. Adam Clark, one Bible commentator, says this about sheep. No creature strays more easily than a sheep. None is more heedless and none so incapable of finding its way back to the flock when once gone astray. And I know you're all beginning to feel personally attacked, aren't you? Because what we realize when we look at Scripture is that you and I are commonly referred to as sheep. So every way that you were shaking your head and just chuckling, ah, those stupid sheep, realize, oh, shoot, I'm the sheep. Isaiah 53 says this, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. 
We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And this theme is, is repeated in the New Testament. In 1 Peter chapter 2, we read, Who himself bore our sins and in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your, of your souls. See, we are those sheep, the defenseless, foolish, constantly going astray, never knowing how to get back sheep. That's us. If there's one thing we're good at doing that comes natural to us, do you know what it is? It's getting lost. It's straying off the path. It's finding ourselves in dangerous situations we can't get ourselves out of. That was us, lost without a way to defend ourselves, dependent on the salvation of another. But look as we read here, not only at the pursuit of this shepherd, but at the process of what takes place when he finds the lost sheep. He goes after the one which is lost until he... This thing is dirty, and yet he is going to guarantee the safe arrival of that sheep all the way home by placing it on his shoulders. Also, because if this sheep was cast like we read, even as he picks it back up, it can't even walk on its own. He needs to carry it. But is that not exactly, you heard it, what Jesus did for us. Coming to earth, living the perfect life we couldn't live, and taking the full weight of our sin on his shoulders, dying on the cross for our sins. He carried the weight. He guaranteed the safe passage home. He completed the work we couldn't do on our own. But not only is this a beautiful picture of the work Jesus did for us, the action that took place as he finds that lost sheep and says, I'm going to carry your burden. Your, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Your yoke is heavy, your burden is more than you can bear, but I'm going to carry it for you. But look not only at the action of this shepherd, but the attitude of this shepherd while he does it. He puts it on his shoulders, rejoicing. Now, I'll be honest with you for a minute. We've had a dog that has gone missing many a time. Uh, she's an expert at escaping, and she's much faster than I am. And when she gets out and I'm on the run, running faster than I want to, longer than I want to, when I finally catch her and get her back on a leash and bring her home, the process of that walk back home, you would not describe Lucas as rejoicing that he has found his lost pet. And I'm sure some of you are the same. We can be honest, this is church. I'm not just singing a hymn and skipping along and carrying my dog. I'm sweating, I am angry, I'm frustrated, and I've got that senile old man grumble under my voice that's, you got out of the house again, I can't believe you. you're never leaving the... But that's not how Jesus is described, how this shepherd is described when they find the lost sheep. They pick up that sheep on their shoulders and they are rejoicing. Not only are they rejoicing, but they go back and they call others to rejoice with them because the lost sheep has been found. Now this process, what it would have looked like in their day is that there would have been multiple shepherds that were out there with the communal flock. And so when one had gone missing, they would send back the other shepherds with the rest of the sheep, and they would arrive home first, and they would alert those of the news that one of the shepherds was still out on the mountain. He was searching for a sheep that had been lost. And many within that village, sometimes all within that village, would rise up to join the watch 
waiting and looking in the distance for that shepherd to return. And when they saw him coming back with the shepherd on his, or with the sheep on his shoulders, he's got a shepherd on his shoulders. This is a very different story. But there would rise within the whole community a shout for joy because the sheep that was lost had been found. The shepherd has returned. There's a shout of joy and thanksgiving and celebration. In Hebrews 12.2, we read about this process of Jesus going to the cross, and we're told that we are to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Not the joy of that moment as he would endure suffering like we can't imagine and shame that we deserve, but the joy set before him as he was going to that cross, he was rescuing the lost sheep and he was bringing them home. And I hope and pray this is an encouragement to any here this morning who have felt either personally concerned or concerned for a loved one, who had once in their life had had confessed Jesus as Lord and were following him closely, and yet they seem to be wandering once again. They've, They've fallen off the path. They've gone astray, and you're concerned for them. Be encouraged this morning that Jesus is a good shepherd, that he's faithful to complete the good work he has started. And as as good as we may think we are in going and seeking someone that is lost, he is a master shepherd. He knows exactly where they're at. He knows exactly what they're going through. He knows the dangers that await them, the thoughts and intents of their heart. And he's not going to let anything, as John 10 says, snatch them out of his hand. No, he seeks the lost sheep. And when he finds them, he rejoices and he picks them up and he places them on his shoulders and he brings them back. And I don't know about you, but when I look at my story, at my testimony of, of how I got to this place I'm at today, it wasn't because... I was a lost sheep who found my way. I was wandering. I was in danger. I was cast on my back with no help and no hope. And then this good shepherd came along and he picked me up and he placed me on his shoulders and he carried me when I couldn't walk. And he led me when I didn't know where to go and he brought me to the flock. We are saved by grace through faith in a good shepherd who sought us out when we were not seeking him, a Savior who died for us while we were still sinners, and a God who, when he found us in that place, in the filth of our sin, lost and alone, did not shame us, did not cast us aside but rejoiced that a lost sheep had been found. I wonder when you view God and you think of him, meeting you in your place of sin, seeing you as you have gone astray once again, how do you view him? Do you view a God that's angry and frustrated, that's filled with rage and fury, that's disgusted with you and is so ashamed of you and disappointed? Or do you view a God who is rejoicing that he has found a lost sheep, celebrating that you're finally looking to him once again, the good shepherd, and now he can lead you out of that place of darkness. The encouragement in Psalm 23 is not that we'll never go through the valley of the shadow of death where there will be difficult times, fearful times, times when you don't know how you're going to make it through. The encouragement is that even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we can fear no evil for he is with us. And it's his rod and his staff 
that comfort us. Not to spank us, not to abuse us, to bring us in and draw us close. They would use that shepherd's staff. They would pull the sheep in close. They would use it to examine their fleece. It was a tool for intimacy, not for punishment. And maybe some of you this morning have felt distant from God and your view of Him is all wrong. You just feel that that He's looking at you with disappointment and shame and frustration and anger and you're staying in that place of condemnation and guilt and, and you feel like you have to figure this out on your own and clean yourself up and then you can come back to Him and He'll receive you. And the call that He's giving this morning to this is to come to Him just as you are. Let Him clean you up. Let Him put you on the right path. Let Him carry you when you can't walk. Come to Jesus. It's His kindness that leads us to repentance. And then He gives this second parable. Or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? Now in this time, as he's sharing this parable with these Pharisees and scribes, these sinners and tax collectors, women would often receive ten silver coins as a wedding gift. They were valuable equaled about a day's wage. This is more than just some loose coins she found in a jar. It's more than a few nickels you found in the crack in your couch. These were sentimental to the wife. Often they were worn as a kind of headdress across her forehead or a necklace around her neck. They were like our modern-day wedding ring. In fact, some scholars even state that the loss of one of these coins was considered an indication in a bride's life of unfaithfulness to her husband. And this may be some of the reasons why there is a a panic-stricken search for that lost coin within the home. Because in the best case scenario, it meant she lost a precious token of remembrance. Worst case scenario, she is dangerously close to being publicly shamed and humiliated if people see her in public missing that coin. But regardless of exactly all the meaning and implications for her, we can all understand the significance of a moment like this when you've lost something precious to you and everything else pauses until you find that thing that is missing. All three of the verbs used here to describe her searching for this are in the present tense, indicating a continuous activity, ongoing pursuit and search until she finds what is lost. She's leaving nothing to chance. She's not waiting for it just to come up in her daily routine. She's leaving no stone unturned. And you have to understand this is a time in a culture where the floor of your house would be dirt with flattened branches that are laid down in it. So finding a small silver coin would be like finding a needle in a haystack. It's nighttime and she's lighting a candle, but that's her only light. You don't just turn on the lights in the house and get a couple flashlights. You don't hear it hit the laminate floor and bounce over a few feet and just see it right there. It's fallen softly onto dirt where you don't hear where it lands. Maybe she doesn't even know when she lost it. Which, side note, is that not the worst question you can ask someone when they've lost something, right? Well, where did you lose it? Let's stop asking that question. If I knew that, it would not be lost. But she has lost a coin. She doesn't know where exactly. She didn't hear it fall, and and she's sweeping the house, and she's looking through the branches, and, and she is seeking everywhere she can under candlelight to try and find it. 
And yet, even when the search seems pointless, even when the odds of finding that coin seem stacked against her, even when others might say, accept the loss, it's gone for good, thanks be to God that just as the parable goes, the search doesn't stop till the coin has been found. And thanks be to God that he didn't stop pursuing us, even when on the outside all hope seemed to be lost. Everything seemed to be stacked against us of ever being found among the people of God. Even when others looked and said, they are a lost cause, they are too far gone, anyone else but them, just be grateful that these other people are following God, that your other children are following God. Thanks be to God that he didn't give up on us even when others did. And that his active pursuit doesn't end until that which is lost has been found. And just as the first parable had gone, there is great joy when what was lost had been found. An invitation is given to all the neighbors and friends to join in the celebration. This is too good to celebrate on my own. I want to invite neighbors and friends and family members to celebrate what God has done in my life. Because that's the comparison he's making here. He says, likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, here's what you don't get just immediately reading this text. This would have shocked the religious Pharisees and the scribes in this room because they had another saying that they would use, one that was well known in their time that went something like this, there will be joy in heaven over one sinner who is obliterated before God. And this is how Pharisees and scribes live their life that the Gentiles served no purpose other than to be fuel to fire the wrath of God. And they had a saying that there will be joy in heaven over one sinner who is obliterated before God. This is how they viewed those sinners and those tax collectors that Jesus is having a meal with right now. Now, we experience joy when those sinners are destroyed, when they are obliterated. There's no hope for them. The only good that's going to come from their life is when the wrath of God removes them from our sight. And Jesus flips this whole saying on its head in the presence of these people when he says, there is more joy over one sinner who repents than over 99 just people that need no repentance. Now, you see the humor also in what he's saying. Not only is he flipping their statement against them, but are there really 99 just people who could say they don't need to repent? No. Paul makes it clear in Romans, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's nobody that's ever lived save Jesus that could ever say, I don't need to repent. I'm a righteous person in my own strength, on my own ability. They're sitting here thinking all of heaven rejoices at the good righteous deeds we're doing. And Jesus is saying, no, there's more rejoicing for this one sinner who repents than over 99 of you thinking that you're in a good standing with God based on your own merit. And it's not just a rejoicing that takes place on earth as we see someone who was lost in sin find hope and salvation and forgiveness and redemption in Jesus but there's joy in the presence of God by the angels over one sinner who repents. Heaven and earth are all rejoicing together over the mighty work of God to bring salvation to a lost soul. Because God goes where no man will go. God saves who no man can save. God leaves no man or no sheep behind. And in his persistent pursuit of the lost, what it's marked by is not frustration, disappointment, or shame, but joy 
as he is victorious in seeking and saving that which was lost. This is Luke's whole emphasis in his gospel is that Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. He came for the sick. He came for the weak. He came for the lame and the blind. C.S. Lewis said this, that joy is the serious business of heaven. You know what the presence of God is described by? Fullness of joy. Where at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. So how fitting a description that there is joy when a lost sheep is brought back to the good shepherd where there is fullness of joy. How fitting a description of heaven that there would be joy and celebration in his presence where there's fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. How fitting a description of the person who was lost and gone without hope and yet has found living hope in Jesus, salvation for their soul, a new identity in Christ, and the ability to be called co-heirs with Christ, where there are treasures laid up for us in heaven. Joy is the right description. It's a reason to rejoice and celebrate Because you and I were the lost coin. You and I were the lost sheep. And what we'll see is a a process that goes on through these parables and the parable next week that what started with one sheep among a hundred, where you might say count your losses, moved now to one coin among ten. And maybe you still say at least you've got nine and next week we'll go one son among two. And it continues to seem to get lower in its value among the others and also more close and intimate of a possession to that which owns it. From a sheep to one of ten coins, a part of this wedding garb to a son, a child, bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, one of his own boys he's raised up. And yet what you don't see is God's heart and God's pursuit any less for the one among a hundred in sheep as opposed to the one, one among two in the sons? See, you and I are terrible at this. We constantly value people and things in our life based on, on how much of them we have and how valuable they are to me, on their usefulness to me. And where you and I might place value on people and say, I'm willing to go all out and give all I have to help this person. We look at another person and we say, too far gone, not worth my time, too much investment, too difficult a pursuit, too painful, too hard. It's going to demand too much of me. That's not the heart of God for the lost. And if we hope to be people that walk in his footsteps, that are his image bearers in this world, we would do well to learn from his heart for the lost. And to say, Lord, show me those people. Show me that lost sheep that I might be used as a part of your work in bringing them back. Can you save anybody? No. But you can definitely help point them in the right direction. You can introduce them to the good shepherd who can save their soul. You can help warn them of the dangers Think of those you may have known who once were in fellowship who have now drifted astray. Is the loving thing to do to let them continue to wander or is the loving thing to do to come alongside them and share your concern, the dangers that await them as they wander that way and to come alongside them and show them a better way coming back to Jesus, the Savior of their soul, the one who can lead them, guide them, protect them, And as we'll see next week, welcomes them back with open arms. This morning, as I invite the worship team to come back up, and as we close our service this morning, 
I want to give an invitation today to those who don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You recognize this morning that you've wandered and maybe you've pursued a lot of different paths in your life. But for the first time, you're seeing clearly that you need to surrender to the Good Shepherd. You need to give your life to Jesus. And you're done wandering. You're tired of being lost. I pray that today is the day of salvation for you. A day you stop fighting against the Lord. You stop wandering away from Him and kicking against His plan for your life. And for the first time, you would humble yourself. You would swallow your pride. You would receive the free gift of salvation that He offers for you. And all that He asks of you is that you do what every person in this room who's given their life to Jesus has done that you confess your sin before Him. You admit that you're a sinner who's failed who's wandered, who can't save themselves, and that the penalty for your sin is death. The Scripture tells us the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you would confess your sin to Him, He is faithful and He is just to forgive you of that sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness because what Jesus did in dying for your sins on the cross. So you confess with your mouth you are a sinner that you believe Jesus is the Son of God who paid for your sins on the cross and you receive Him as your Lord and Savior, your Good Shepherd, and He will forgive you of your sins. He will take your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. You'll become a new creation in Christ Jesus where old things have passed away and all things are new and He will set you on a path of righteousness. It's an incredible gift one we don't deserve, but one given freely by grace. And all he asks is that you confess and believe. And if that's you this morning and you want to make that decision, we would ask that you either raise your hand or you stand up where you are so that we can pray for you this morning and welcome you into the family of God today. Is there anybody that needs to make that decision? Well, then trusting this morning that we are among the family of God, sheep with a good shepherd who has sought us out when we were lost and gone astray, I also want to give another invitation because here's the reality. What are sheep good at doing? Getting lost, wandering off that path, going astray. And though I know that if you are saved, you are in his hand and nothing will pluck you out. You are sealed with his Holy Spirit, which is your guarantee. I also know that we are weak. And like sheep, we continue to give in to our flesh, to wander off that path, to go astray. And that decision to once again come alongside the good shepherd and allow him to lead us and guide us can be difficult at moments when we feel guilty, when we feel embarrassed, when we feel ashamed because I should have known better, I shouldn't have wandered. Remember this morning, he rejoices not only when a lost sheep is found, but when a wandering sheep is brought back to the fold. And so this morning, I want to give an opportunity for anybody who's among the family of God. You know you're saved. You've given your life to Jesus. He is your good shepherd, and yet you've found yourself wandering. Maybe further than others. Maybe you've just barely wandered off the path, but you know this morning I've wandered. I'm not following my good shepherd. I, I haven't been where I belong. I haven't been keeping company with who I should. I haven't been filling my mind with what I should. I haven't, you wouldn't know I'm a sheep. If you saw me outside of church on Sunday, whatever it may be, if, if you find yourself in that place this morning, under the banner of grace, knowing there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus, 
for those who are his, for those who are following after him, I would call you as well to stand up where you are so we can pray alongside you. So that we can encourage you and support you as a brother or sister in Christ who recognizes, I've wandered. That I want to be brought back in this morning into the fold and I want to be led more clearly onto that path where I follow in the footsteps of my good shepherd. Praise God. Anybody else this morning that needs to stand up? If there's one place you can be honest and real about that, it's in this building right here and right now. Anyone else this morning need to stand? You know they're a part of your family. They're a brother and sister in Christ, and they're making the bold decision to stand up this morning and admit, hey, I'm, I've wandered from the shepherd. This is how church works. We come alongside those. We bear one another's burdens. And there's no guilt or shame for them. It's a bold decision and one that the Lord is honored in as you humble yourself. So let's pray for those who have stood this morning. God, we thank you for those in this room. Your children, God, your sons and your daughters. Lord, who have seen where they've either given, given into the flesh or been deceived by the enemy and, and wandered from the path. They've wandered from the flock. They've found themselves in mixed company or mixed things that are not worthy of a child of God. Lord, I pray this morning that you would wash away any guilt or shame. We celebrate conviction, Lord, where you rightfully call us to repent of things. But Lord, when there is a lingering shame and guilt that begins to shape their identity and push, you, push them from you, we know that is from the enemy and not from you. So God, I, I pray this morning that, that you would wipe that away, that they would remember their identity in Christ, that they are forgiven, they are redeemed, they are your child. And you're a good shepherd who rejoices this morning along with us and all of heaven, not only when a lost sheep has been found, but when a wandering sheep has been returned. Thank you, God, that your mercies are new every morning, that where sin abounds, grace abounds so much more. And God, I pray they would feel the full expression of your love and your joy this morning that they would leave this place not identifying as a wandering sheep, but as a sheep in the fold, in the presence of God, who is near and dear to his heart. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your pursuit of us, Lord. And we recognize this morning, not a single one of us would be in this room as a follower of you, if you did not first pursue us and seek us out. Thank you for that loving pursuit. Thank you for that gracious gift. Thank you for the hope and family and forgiveness we found in you alone, Jesus. And it's in your mighty name we pray. And all God's people said, amen.